Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV, episode number th- uh, 404. Oh, this is the four. episode that even I almost forgot. <laughs> but fortunately for you, we got a header 200 response Ooh. tonight instead of a 404. So welcome to the show. Tonight, we've got a lot going on. Uh, we have, first of all, David Lukacs is joining us from Yappin. We're going to be talking about how they have built the universal translator of e-commerce. You want to stick around for that. Mm. Also, we're giving away a free copy of Unreal. Raid 6 Pro. So don't go anywhere. To the newsroom, Sasha Dermatis, what's coming up? Well, here's what's coming up in the Category 5.tv newsroom. The Oculus virtual reality headset is being used to help treat soldiers with post-traumatic stress disorder. Apple has revealed that its weird camera-mounted vans seen roaming the streets of California are being used to gather images for a street mapping app. The E3 Games show is underway in Los Angeles, and we've got the skinny on some big releases coming soon, including a remake of your favorite first-person shooter from the 90s. YouTube is launching a dedicated site and app for gaming in an attempt to take on Amazon-owned streaming service Twitch. And Ouya, the Android-based gaming console maker, has been bought out by a competitor. Stick around. The full details are coming up later in the show. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Starring Sasha Dermatis. Hillary Rumble. Krista Wells. Eric Kidd. And your host, Robbie Ferguson. Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. I'm your host, Robbie Ferguson. I'm Hillary Rumble. Here, there she keeping is. it real. Yeah, you ready for a great show? I am. It's been a while since I've been here, so I am excited to be back in the studio and catching up on things, it's good seeing to have what's you here. new. Mm-hmm, Having a good start to the summer so far? So far, so good. You know, summer's this time of mayhem for me, as some mm-hmm. of you may know. I'm very busy working at camp and such, so this has been the beginning of. Uh, a little bit of chaos, gotcha. but I'm loving it. Gotcha. Hey, uh, speaking of loads of fun, we have uh, received a postcard. <laughs> well, sort of like a postcard. We received this from Whiskey Zero, who says we just don't really have picture f- postcards. In my little hometown. So he sent a recipe card, which is cool. Which we we'll love. We'll still take it. We love it. We'll still take it. Whiskey Zero, thanks for sending that in. And just for that... We've got some premium vinyl stickers from the Category 5 shop at shop.category5.tv to give you. Those are going in the mailbox for you this week. How can they win? The next four, count it, one, two, three, four people to send us a postcard from your respective hometowns will also receive some sweet stickers of your own. There you go. Also... The uh, anyone who sends them in uh, sends us a postcard between now and July 1st is also going to be entered into a draw where we are going to be randomly picking names and uh, sending you a full set of autographed business cards mm-hmm. of the Category 5 crew. So Very you don't cool. Miss out on that as well. Speaking of prizes and giveaways and all that, we've got a copy of Unraid 6 Pro to give mm-hmm. away this week. If you're not familiar with Unraid 6, make sure you head on over to our website, category5.tv, and check out episode number 403, <laughs> where we talked about it in depth. There you go. We didn't want the conversation to end. It was so cool. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, so are we ready for it? I'm going to throw right over to our buddy David Lukacs, who joins us from Yappin. And I'm not even going to yap a whole lot about what it is that you do, David, because uh, I want to hear it right from the horse's mouth. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. 
Thanks, Robbie. Thanks, Sasha. Thanks, Hillary. Can you? Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Can you tell us a little bit about what Yappin is, kind of from the get-go? And, uh, you know, I mentioned off the top of the show, this is the universal translator of e-commerce. We're going to talk a little bit about that as we go. Uh, but what is Yappin, for those of you who haven't, uh, those viewing at home who haven't heard of Yappin? Well, for most uh, consumers will never even see Yappin, but what Yappin does is it helps um, e-commerce vendors sell globally uh, to people around the world, regardless of the language that they speak. Simply put, we take uh, a store in English and make it available in 67 languages instantly and in real time. Wow, that's something that uh, with e-commerce is a little bit more complicated than just, say, translating a website or a block of text with Google Translate or something like that. Because I suppose you've got a lot of, you're dealing with secure connections, you're dealing with data that is behind the scenes of the e-commerce platform. Uh, how does your product or your service work differently than some of the other translation options that are out there? Well, most of the translation options that we're familiar with, Robbie, uh, start by cutting and pasting. We, we cut something from a document, we paste it into a box, and we get a translation. And that's really not real time and, and everything we do in life is really in real time so what Yappin does is we help businesses emulate that situation so we work with them again you got it right behind the firewall deep down where things are secure and we help translate data at the beginning so what you're getting if your browser is set to Spanish and I've got an English store is you're getting a completely oh. Spanish experience from basically soup to nuts we make it easy affordable and more than anything, what we really try and do is add respect to the transaction because that's what we all want. We want to be respected. So it sounds to me as though from a, an end user standpoint, so you're detecting the language of the user's computer basically by their browser headers and then you can serve up the appropriate translation in real time? Absolutely. And, and, and you've got it right down to science. Most people don't really get that, but we, we check IP because... Let's say I'm a vendor okay. that is selling products and I have a localized special. Yeah. I want my customers in that local market to be able to get that special, but we also want them to get it in their language. Hmm. So, And what's really cool is, let's say your browser is set to French. You pick up your computer and you go to China. You don't want a Chinese experience. You want a French experience. Right. We maintain that French experience. And we do that not only in e-commerce, but we look at it from... We look at e-commerce in three components because everything we do really follow, follows this. We look at marketing, sales, and support. So marketing is where we socialize and engage through social media and other activities, and we make that available in real time. Then we make the store and the cash register or the checkout in real time available in that language. And then we allow people to converse with the companies through customer care in the language of their choice as well. Really, I want I want to hear more about the social the social media and uh, and that kind of aspect, the support end of things. Uh, we're speaking with David Lukacs from Yappin. He's the CEO there. Check them out yappin.com to find out more about their service, the, the service that they provide. Basically, a global translation service for e-commerce, social media. You you guys are covering a lot of different stuff. You mentioned customer service and that is where we're all lacking in business. I mean, we, our small company, the, the company that I work for, we don't have any French speaking individuals on staff. We used to have. And so, you know, we have a fairly large client base in Quebec. Fortunately for us, English is a fairly, you know, universal language, if you will, in that most people who call us are able to, you know, we're able to converse back and forth. But there's a real gap when it comes to communicating with these customers and potential customers. How does Yappin help with the customer service aspect, David? Well, it, it's really interesting. Yappin is, is, was really born out of chat. And, uh, really? Okay. So um, early on, um, the, the predecessor of Yappin, actually we still hold it. We hold the Guinness World Records for the most nationalities in an online chat. So, so from naturally from chat, we looked at customer service and customer service we do everything by text, so customer service is just two people having a conversation. Yeah, and and working with um, you know the right tools, whether that just by um, might be live person or right now, we can enable those services 
to offer multilingual chat so that you can be chatting in English and your client can be chatting in French and you'll see that seamlessly. We, offer, we also offer that same service as a chat platform for blogs and for companies that want to conduct chat in multiple languages. The idea is that you don't ever have to see someone else's language. You just need to see your own. That's really cool. I guess that's where the universal translator aspect comes in. And we think about Star Trek and how all that technology uh, was a thing of fantasy just 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And now you're making it a reality. And now one thing as you're speaking about this, David, uh, my concern, say, as a business owner, as a, an e-commerce platform provider is going to be, of course, accuracy. There's some technical language that's that's in use. I have, for example, now I'm a web developer, so I work with all different companies building their websites, and I'm currently working with, uh, of all things, uh, a horse feed company. And they are branching out into Quebec, and so we're launching French website. And, and it was realized in the process of doing this website that horse feed translated directly into French makes it kind of sound like I'm going to eat a horse. So context is very, very important when it comes to translation service. How does Yappen establish itself in this marketplace of, you know, against the, the greats like Google Translate? And how do you combat those kinds of grammatical issues that can really have a, a pretty substantial impact on the quality of the translation? I mean, that's a great example. Um, in short, we understand content, context, and we also understand something very, uh, two things. One is rule sets for language, yeah. and the last one is we have lexicons. So horse feed would be a, a word that we would translate and right. know that every time that word came up in English, we'd have to systematically replace it with the right terminology. Right. So um, it, for some of our clients, if someone spells the word tractor incorrectly, spell it with a K, we don't pass that through. We have lexicons mm. for that particular client or that particular industry that allow us to do search and replace. And we did that recently for Disney and a Star Wars event where we did the closed captioning globally um, really? uh, for oh, J.J. So cool. Abrams to Kathleen Kennedy's uh, broadcast in April. And Disney or, or Lucasfilms has a very specific lexicon for certain terms. And if those terms came up in conversation, as we were doing the closed ca captioning, we understood, first of all, it was a Star Wars conversation. And secondly, of course um, it was. we replaced the terms accordingly. <laughs> so it's all about rule sets and understanding that, the, wow. the way language goes together. Again, a great statement would be the basketball player is traveling. Now, what does that mean? Mm. It could mean that the yeah. basketball player is at the airport and getting a plane. It could right. be the basketball players at the hotel, but for most instances, it probably means the basketball player committed a rule infraction during a game. By looking at what's happening before and after that particular statement in real time, we can understand that it is a basketball conversation and it's related to a rule infraction. So are you looking at, from a translation perspective, the kind of entire um, verbiage of like paragraph after paragraph and translating based on the context specifically? Um, sort of, yes. We, we, we really focus on what we call short burst translation. And, and we do two things. We focus on short bursts, and that's exactly what we're doing right now. We're kind of having a tennis match with a conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, you serve, I hit, I return. I, I, you know, I volley, you volley. I mean, that's the way that really things go in real time. It's not really made up of paragraphs. So we focus right. on on the contextual um, volley that's going on. I think about how search engines work and how uh, these days the keywords, meta tags are not really as important anymore because context is established through the verbiage of a website. So even though maybe the site itself is not indexed in such a way that you, that the search engines are looking at specific words and phrases and paragraphs, they're able to gain the context so that if I'm searching for Java in the context of a coffee house versus Java in the context of an island, it's going to be able to establish that based on what is found in the context of the site. So it's, it's interesting to see that kind of technique being used for translation. Uh, David? Uh, yeah, we established that really early and that's exactly, you've hit the nail on the head again, Robbie. David, do you think that we're ever going to get to the point? You mentioned about um, closed caption translation and working with Disney. And obviously, if you're working with a big uh, company such as Disney, they have 
full confidence in your capabilities of translating in context. Uh, I did try, I'll be honest with you, um, just recently uh, translating video um, uh, subtitles to French, and they came out really poorly using Google Translate. And I think largely that was the, the inability to, to glean the context of what was being said in the video, and things just didn't work out. And so there's really, there, there has always been, and there still continues to be a need for human translation services. And where does that, where, where do you stand in that? And is there ever going to be a day when electronic translation services, such as your, yourselves at Yappen, is going to really be effective enough to outdo the, the uh, human translation? So that's a great string of items. So let me try and knock those pins down. One is in our enterprise customer ser service um, platform, we can 82 to 86% of the time actually emulate a native person. The person on the other end does not know that they're speaking, they're chatting with someone who's using a ma machine interpreter. Very cool. But having said that, we truly believe that human translation is an important part of uh, of a business. So um, let's say that you're selling board shorts. You don't want that to translate into cardboard tiny little pants. So, <laughs> right? Like horse feet, right? You don't want to eat yeah. a horse. So, so the idea is within the context of what we're doing, we allow our clients to create do not translate lists, um, so if your company name was extreme with an X, you wouldn't want to translate it. If an actress's right. name was summer morning, you wouldn't really want to translate that. Mm -hmm. But, um, but at the same time, maybe that, maybe we need to tune it up a little bit. So we allow our clients to pick and choose particular words or phrases, which then we use a, a partnership with a company called Verbalize It, um, where we'll do crowdsource translation for that. So we're really? always striving okay. for higher accuracy and learning as we go. Um, the other value that we have in speed and is speed to market, and that's really primarily due to the Microsoft Azure platform. We do work with AWS um, for some occasions, but we found um, uh, since the inception of the of Azure that it really is again soup to nuts. There's nothing really better. We we global footprint, and so that allows us to create an experience that takes less than two seconds to happen. So we're talking about cloud infrastructure, the ability to serve Absolutely. up this information really, really quickly, uh, comparing Microsoft's product versus Amazon's product, and Microsoft is the one, from what you're saying, um, that, that well, you've really gone Yeah, with. and part of it is because Microsoft is global. I mean, it, there isn't probably a country in the world that, that hasn't used Microsoft software. Sure. Mm -hmm. So the Azure platform is, is seamlessly integrated in those, you know, kind of nodes around the world where you've got some countries that, you know, aren't so happy with certain companies. And, and so we find working with Microsoft, we have, uh, there's a lot of bandwidth, a yeah. lot of opportunity to be global and our clients demand, um, not only accuracy, but speed. You don't want to be waiting for something um, to translate. You want it to now, happen. That's something, that's something that I was wondering and was going to be a question that I wanted to ask. Um, when it comes to speed, Really, I mean, I'm thinking about, let's back it up a little bit, talking about e-commerce and I'm going through the cart system and making my purchases and things are happening on the fly and translation is going on. How, how much latency is this adding to that transaction? Um, well, okay, so this is an interesting situation because you're only looking in your language of choice. In some cases, some of that information that, that is static may be cached, so you never see any latency. Oh, Okay, uh -huh. so because somebody else who is French speaking has already been through this process, right? So there is some caching. So let me give an example. When when we did the Star Wars event in a one hour broadcast globally, we um, translated well over a hundred million characters, right? And that's kind of effectively eighty seven hundred typists per minute, average wow. typist per minute. Yeah, no latency anywhere in the world. Unreal. <laughs> yeah, so we've we've really after the last five years we've figured it out, and and in a lot of cases, I mean, we work with companies, you know, in in certain instances like Google or Microsoft or other um, other people in the translation industry because we find that our efforts are supported by efforts of others. 
So our real secret sauce is the ability to deliver in real time and deliver experience that does cover you know marketing, sales, and support where most people have just focused literally on the cash register. Right. Okay, so I'm thinking about that e-commerce situation kind of going right back to the beginning of this discussion and how when I'm going through a checkout process, I'm probably hesitant to copy and paste everything into uh, and I use Google Translate as the example because everybody knows of it. Uh, but I'm not necessarily going to use their service because I feel like there's that extra um, kind of chance for mi- man in the middle kind of thing. What what kind of security is involved in providing this service? It sounds like yours is less front end and more happening behind the scenes. Is that kind of part uh, of where the security comes from? Very true. But but you know I want to I want to kind of drop some stats on you if I might. Sure. So so we work with a lot of large client groups and one in particular that is in um, you'd recognize the name if I told you, but unfortunately I can't. I'd have to kill you um, and everyone <laughs> in the room. Uh, um, but uh, they 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 sell for their clients. They sell concert merchandise and paraphernalia. And what they found was that somewhere between eighty and ninety percent of um, abandonment rate to the shopping cart occurred when language was an issue. So uh. language really mattered. The other thing, just to keep in mind, as we have this conversation, is that there's three billion people online. And almost 72, 73% do not surf in English. Wow. The I'm sorry, 72 to 73% are surfing in another language than English? Other than English. English That's is the shocking. Eight, number eight fastest growing language in the world, not number one through seven. It is, is the eight. Is Klingon and, a part of the top 10? Right, exactly. It's, the, it's really, it, <laughs> it just fell below Malay. <laughs> hmm. That's, Seriously, that's a surprising stat for sure. Um, well, we've got, sorry, sorry, David. We've got an interesting question in the chat room from Blue sure. Nose Guy. Um, perhaps Hillary can uh, bring that up for us. I think it really has to do with um, dialect, mm-hmm. and, and in particular, like we noticed that in Canada, uh, the difference sure between like Quebecois, Francais, Acadian, and then even Parisian French, like the the differences in dialect, right? Um, right. How does that? translate how do you navigate those particular dialects and I you would see that anywhere really well well so let's let's look at some of the the the, the languages that usually are affected by that um, Castilian Spanish and um, Latin Spanish can be very different so we handle both yes. of those we also handle um, uh, European Portuguese and um, uh, Brazilian Portuguese again some nuances but what's really interesting when you talk about dialects, and I'll use one that's probably one of the biggest in the world, is Chinese. People talk about Cantonese, they talk about Mandarin, they talk about localized dialects. Well, Chinese in written form is either simplified or traditional Chinese. So dialects don't really appear. Same is, is, is really where we focus in French. Not to be, um, not to be rude, um, because I don't, because I'm, 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 very, very thrilled that we are a bilingual country. Mm-hmm. However, um, from a global perspective, uh, perspective, um, Quebec French does not really require us to create a whole new version of French. The the right. economies aren't just large enough. But when we go back to words like horse feed, or um, I have one word that just came to mind, probably isn't isn't kind of great for a dialogue on television and radio. Um, but <laughs> some of the words that we would use. Um, would be um, native to that region, and those would be in lexicons for us. So let me give you an example. Right, we okay. have a dirty word filter that is 5,000 words <laughs> in, I believe, 16 <laughs> languages. Hmm. So <laughs> I, We'll just I, let that I, sit I, with you for just a minute. I, wow. You know, I've, I've learned some really new things in the last <laughs> few years. How to say some certain things in 67 different languages. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I'm. Let's say I'm uh, launching an e-commerce solution. I want to be able to sell uh, in multiple different languages. What kind of a process is there involved, and what what's the deployment? Uh, what what time are we looking at to say, okay, I'm contacting Yap, and I want to make this happen. What do we do? Well, let's. Let, there's there's really two approaches that we have to e-commerce. One is we have large customers that have um, complicated builds, and most of them are custom. And then mm-hmm. we have a situation where we're building for most of the major players out there. So the first one we've launched um, is, is close to home for all of us is, is an app for Shopify. 
So right. you can build a store in Shopify, go in and pick Yappin's Windrose um, app, which allows you to connect language, um, install it, and within, on average, about 10 minutes, your site is converted. A second site is converted into the language of choice. Wow. Now, why that matters is because traditionally, if you wanted a French store, you'd have to build a second store, and if you wanted a German store, you'd have to build a third store, and if you wanted a Spanish store, you'd build a fourth store. Yep. Then you'd have to manage all the marketing, localization, um, inventory separately. Support. We, yeah, exactly. We just create a new version of your store, and as you update your store, our systems automatically update that new version of the store. Hmm. So it's kind of about a 10-minute process if you're using Shopify. And it's wow. really inexpensive. One language costs fifteen dollars a month for ten thousand characters. That's brilliant. And you think about a, a you know company. I mean, we're in it to make money. If we're starting an e-commerce platform, and right. uh, that's 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 negligible. So that's fantastic. Um, what do you do as far as the sales cycle goes when it comes to you know from start to finish? Um, how do how does your solution now you you say with this particular version it it creates kind of a redundant copy of the store in a different language it sounds like that is synced to my main store is that right yeah and that then, is correct. so if I'm checking out of the like a sub store in a different language it's going to go through the process in that language even though I've entered everything in English uh yes I think if I think if I got the question right the answer is yes I, we I, um and ultimately. Ultimately, if you're doing customer service ultimately in English or receiving orders, even though it was processed in French, you'd receive it in English as see, the that's, vendor. That's the interesting. See, I'm trying to get my head around this. So I've created a store in English. You've then taken it and created it in Spanish. Mm -hmm. Spanish speaking individual goes, makes a purchase, goes through the whole process in Spanish, sends mm -hmm. a support question, whatever, and I get everything back in English. And I can yep. respond and go back and forth. Yep. That's brilliant. What uh, what other kind of solutions can you integrate with? Well, in social media, we integrate with about fifty four social networks. Okay. Um, because there are more than three. <laughs> uh, I'm in tech, and I thought there were only like ten. Well, so you know, you no, got you got me beat. There's about 160, and we currently integrate with about fifty four of them. Um, Wonderful. I, and we have we have a number of marketing solutions that allow you to post photos and and and, and videos and share those globally. Mm -hmm. um, we do uh, Twitter chats in multiple languages. We, we've done um, – uh, our most recent Twitter chat uh, was probably um, late, uh, uh, one that you'd recognize as late last fall. We did the uh, chat for Keanu Reeves and IMDb and Lionsgate wow. for Keanu's uh, launch of his movie, uh, John Wick. So as he was, as he was typing in, in that, it was being translated in real time for people who were in other languages? Is that it was absolutely cooler than that. What okay. happens is Keanu was sitting in front of his screen. Yeah. Whatever tweets were coming into that hashtag, he would see them in the native language and in English. He would be able really? to pick the questions he wanted to answer, respond to those questions, and actually pump them back out or, or have them distributed not only in, his, in English but in the native language in which they were originated. No. And way. on a website that was related to the movie – or this event, they would pair the answers and the questions together. Wow. I, it's, it's, I'm picturing Keanu sitting there with that Neo look in his eyes, <laughs> like he's in the Matrix in this situation. That's, that's brilliant, David. Thank you yeah. so much for, uh, for your time tonight. And how can we find out more about Yappin? Uh, visit yappin.com. That's the place to start, and we'd be happy to help anyone out there who's got a challenge with language. Very good. David, thank you so much. And that is yappen.com, and it's spelled, as you see uh, under David there, Y-A-P-P-N. Thanks, David. It's been a pleasure you. having you here. Take care. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank Thanks. you. This is Category 5 Technology TV. As I stretch over there, welcome to the show. This is episode number 404. Mm -hmm. Hillary. Hey. I'll let you kind of do your thing while I kind of switch, <laughs> switch modes here. And <laughs> You're watching Category 5.TV, and we are a member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. And you can learn more about that by visiting cat5.tv slash tpn. And we're also a member of the International Association, or 
Yes, the International Association of Internet Broadcasters. And more info can be found by visiting cat5.tv slash IAIB. Awesome. Really enjoyed I'm that. Into the chat room it's here. okay. I really enjoyed that <laughs> conversation. That was really interesting. It has my brain thinking in multiple languages. In I'm dans multiple langues. Mais oui. I'm mm. really thinking like, what if you like accidentally, fe- not accidentally, I guess, but fell in love with somebody like in a completely foreign <laughs> language, and you're both and it's all speaking. Yappen's fault. David, what yeah. have you done? What have <laughs> you done? I've what? fallen in love with a lass who only speaks German. Exactly. <laughs> and then you have this huge communication. You could only communicate via like text from Maybe that that's point on. that's actually their their goal is to make it so mm. that your entire relationship, your marriage, your parenting, everything relies on their platform. Yeah. It wow. makes sense, right? Good wow. marketing. Hey Good y'all. marketing. There you go. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Perfect. we're going to head over to the newsroom. Sasha is standing by ever so patient. Thanks, Sasha. It's Tuesday, June 16th, 2015, and here are the stories we're covering this week. A student has come up with an interesting and potentially useful purpose for the Oculus Rift, treating soldiers with post-traumatic stress disorder. Apple has started shooting the imagery needed for a street view like map or street view like map system for iOS and OS X. Fallout 4 and the release of a Doom remake were announced at E3. We'll tell you what we learned. And watch out Twitch, YouTube is starting up a brand new game streaming site. Ooh yeah, the Android based gaming console maker has been bought out by one of their competitors. These stories are coming right up. Don't go anywhere. Becca Ferguson, my darling wife, has a novel that's available on Kindle, and it is available absolutely free until Sunday. Mm -hmm. So get on over to BeccaFerguson.com. That's B-E-K-A-H-F-E-R-G-U-S-O-N.com. And check out A White Rose, and that is available for you absolutely free on Kindle. Also available in paperback form. Uh, So check it out, BeccaFerguson.com. Back is, to the newsroom. Ah, hey, is, yeah. Is it available for free in paperback form as well? It is not. Okay. It's not free in paperback. It's free on my it's Kindle. It's free on your Kindle, <laughs> yeah. Because okay. they got to pay for paper and stuff. Oh, yeah, there's that. You know, true, they got to yeah. pay for the paper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Sasha Dermatis, and here are the top stories from the Category 5.TV newsroom. To help treat soldiers with post-traumatic stress disorder, Jennifer Patterson turned to a gadget typically associated with video games, the virtual reality headset from Oculus, a company Facebook Inc. bought for $2 billion last year. Patterson, an engineering student at the University of Pittsburgh, studied a software used on the prototype of the head-mounted display that creates virtual settings, such as a Middle Eastern-themed city or a desert road that soldiers would otherwise avoid as a way to help them recover from their PTSD. She hopes doctors and therapists around uh, around the country will better understand how the technology can be helpful to their own patients. Patterson is one of a handful of researchers who have used the display for experimental treatments and studies that range from treating glaucoma patients to easing the pain in burn victims. I think that's a really smart idea, actually. I mean, I guess in a situation where a soldier returns home and suffers from PTSD, they don't really have the ability to go back, right? Mm -hmm. To, To sort of digest and work through some things. So the Oculus headset would help that. It's amazing that, I mean, I love technology being used to help people. And and when it can be used, you think about virtual reality as a way to deal with Mm -hmm. um, the emotional strain of of being in combat, for example, or and having to deal with that and using the technology to help Mm -hmm. is pretty cool. It is cool. And I thought it was just for games. So well done. (laughs) technology you know, I feel like it could be it could be used really well for emotional reasons too if you if you thought ahead enough and you could take video or something of people's like childhood hey. homes and stuff you could really walk through your past yeah. as an adult right and you can walk other people through it Right? Instead of yeah. having a photo book, you'd be like, this is my nursery. <laughs> if, that, if that ever came to that, that would be amazing because I think about, you know, my first apartment and how cool it would be to see more than just the front of the building now. Yeah. Like to have, mm-hmm. to have a walkthrough that you can actually see and, and actually feel like you're there because it's basically 3D. 
This that would be neat. This could be a big thing. Okay. How how could we possibly film in 3D, Sasha? How could that's, we? That's our segue. Oh. Apple. <laughs> <laughs> Here's how. Apple has revealed that its weird camera-mounted vans seen roaming the streets of California are being used to gather images for a street mapping app. Apple confirmed that it will be taking vehicles mounted with cameras around Europe and the U.S. to gather street-level snaps for Apple Maps for iOS and OS X. Pretty much exactly like a Google Street View. We are committed to protecting your privacy while collecting this data, Apple said in the notice. For example, we will blur out faces and license plates on collected images prior to publication. They probably learned that from like Google Maps. Yeah, they did. actually learned mm-hmm. that from Google Google Street View. Yeah. The one that has been around for a decade. 10 years or so. <laughs> so funny. So <laughs> usually Apple is leading edge, I thought. No, this <laughs> is the thing. We're new not looking, looking, innovating anymore, they're people. They're not even looking like new vans. These are not new looking vans. No, this is basically like this is like your mom's van <laughs> and they've basically strapped what looks like a quadcopter on the top. <laughs> like, you think that they could at least make it like drones or like, I don't, I don't know, a self-driving car or something. They something. wanted it to be inconspicuous. It's very conspicuous. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. more conspicuous this way. I don't know. It's what do you think of that, though? though? I mean, companies like Google innovating and then Apple is actually feeling like they're falling behind. I mean, it's, it's yeah, you, there comes a point when you say, okay, we have to do this. Maps has always been a problem for Apple. Mm-hmm. Always been a problem, right? Well, <laughs> you remember what happened last time, Apple? So I hope they do better stitching 3D imagery together. Well, here's the thing, Robbie. Mm-hmm. Last week, I did a story about how Street View is now like going beyond the street and doing underwater exploration and sure. bringing you down to the depths of the ocean. Like you can explore probably Mariana's Trench by now in Street View. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, sorry. I'm, I'm wondering not even when they're going to take it to space. You know, Google is going to take it to space. Of course, oh. they and you're going to be and you're going to be doing Street View in space. You'll be Street View in the moon. That's what you I don't see why not. Just stick one of their Street View cars on the moon, and it's done. You can just it's zip on around. Yeah. I and don't know. Boom. I don't understand. Like Map Apple. The whole moon. Why is Apple playing catch up? That's what I'd like to know. The, the I announce- have my theories, but we need to move along. <laughs> the announcement puts to rest the debate over just what Apple was doing with its mysterious camera-equipped vans. Some industry pundits had suggested that the vans were part of a secret project by Apple to develop a self-driving car that would use the cameras to align itself on the road. That would have been cooler. With the mapping move confirmed, Apple now plans to begin the process of driving around Europe and the U.S., gathering the images for the Street View option. The shoot started yesterday and will take place stateside and in Ireland and the UK until June 30th. So there we go. This is great. In gaming news, the popular post-apocalyptic video game Fallout 4 will be released on November 10th. Publisher Bethesda made the announcement at its press conference at the Electronic Entertainment Expo, also known as the E3 Games Show in Los Angeles. Their event kicked off the biggest week of the year for the video game industry. The company had shared a trailer for Fallout 4 earlier this month, but gameplay sequences were shown for the first time on Sunday. Also getting a first showing at the event was a remake of iconic series Doom, the game which defined the first-person shooter genre when it was released in the early 90s. In a nod to the original game, weapons such as the super shotgun and chainsaw were demonstrated, keeping with the series' style. A uh, multiplayer mode was also shown off, including a Doom Snap Map, a tool for creating modifications to the game, including custom-designed maps. The Doom remake will be released next spring. Awesome. We are only allowed to show the logo. We're not allowed to show... We can't show game footage or anything, because uh, it's a G-rated show. Oh. Oh, yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's like I play Mortal Kombat. I am afraid to think about what a game like Doom could do in 2015. So fun. The only thing that I'm sad about is the whole spring thing. Because you want to play video games through the winter, right? You don't want to play them in the spring. Well, it's coming out in... Well, oh, I guess, yeah, Doom is coming out next spring, right? 
Yeah. They should you, have asked you first. Well, they they got to fall out four is going to take you through the winter and then doom is going to take you through the summer. So you basically will have no life <laughs> during the next year, <laughs> which and is problem solved. Exactly. Yeah. All right. YouTube is launching a dedicated site and app for gaming in an attempt to take on Amazon owned streaming service, Twitch. Twitch allows gaming fans to watch and interact with live broadcasts of other playing others playing games. Google, which owns YouTube, is understood to have made a bid for Twitch last year only to be beaten by Amazon's 970 $970 million dollar offer. Whew. YouTube gaming manager or product manager Alan Joyce said, on YouTube, gaming has spawned entirely new genres of videos, from let's plays, walkthroughs, and speedruns to cooking and music videos. Now it's our turn to return the favor with something built just for gamers. Google hopes the new service will lure gamers away from Twitch, which currently dominates the market for live online broadcasting. Around 12 billion hours of live gaming are watched on the site every month. Wow. Another competitor, Steam Broadcasting, caters to PC gamers but is less popular. YouTube Gaming's, YouTube Gaming's launch will initially be in the US and UK and the service will launch later this summer. Well, so that what do you think about that? Well, you say <laughs> that um, perhaps, you know, the goal is to draw uh, draw people away from Twitch to this new YouTube gaming platform. Mm-hmm. I wonder if it might draw them away from YouTube. Cuz <laughs> is it just me or is it like it's completely covered in Minecraft? Mhm. Right? Like you go to the homepage of YouTube and it's True. just covered in games and you know if you're not into that that then you know the kids love it diamond minecart for the win but maybe <laughs> there's a better place for that or at least a better way to <laughs> categorize but there google goes again well this time google's doing what i was just uh, accusing apple of doing i guess a little bit right? right it's a little tit for tat here to be fair though i mean google um took youtube and turned it into something much more powerful than it ever was and so what are they going to do when they branch out into this and twitch is a whole different i mean twitch was justin.tv originally and justin.tv branched out to twitch and then they shut down mm-hmm. justin.tv and then twitch was bought out by amazon and now google is trying to become a twitch killer <laughs> we'll have to see where that goes oh boy. we'll hmm. have to see where it goes struggling android gaming console maker ouya has been bought by razor the popular gaming peripherals company that has been recently or recently has been diversifying its gaming portfolio by dipping its toes into the fields of virtual reality tv consoles laptops and even reaching further out into fitness tracking wearables Ouya was reported to have been looking for a buyout as far back as April, and recent reports pointed to Razer being the chief contender for such an acquisition. The news of the deal came via Mesa Global, an investment bank that was financial advisor to Ouya for the sale, with a post on its site that was removed soon after. So, on again, off again, I guess. <laughs> Interestingly, both Ouya and Razer's Android game console have roughly the same price point of $100, though the, the Forge TV bundle costs $149, but that includes the controller. The Forge TV should soon have an advantage compared to its competitors in the market, however, of allowing users to stream PC games to their TV via the console using the upcoming Razer Cortex streaming technology. Further details about the Razer Ouya deal remain uncertain for now, including the amount Razer paid, just what it is getting for its purchase, and what the plans for the gaming peripherals manufacturer has for the Android game console maker. It could potentially use the talent at hand to better its own game console, Forge TV, which was showcased at CES 2015. So another acquisition, probably assimilate and destroy or something. Who knows, eh? I mean, the competitor. I'm really, really impressed with how uh, Android devices are handling gaming. Um, We put the Fire TV stick on our TV at home uh, to give Mm -hmm. it a test, and... It's 
it, at its core, it's a super fast little tiny itty bitty computer that lets you play. The kids are playing a, any Android games on there, and it's really yeah. really cool. But I didn't realize that Ouya was failing. But I, it makes it kind of makes me think like when I can get a Fire TV stick for less money, and there there is a gaming controller for it that is like a it's like a PlayStation Three remote, as hmm. far as you know what I see when I look at it. <laughs> <laughs> like a, an actual gaming remote that you can use with it so it becomes a gaming unit and you're not having to pay as much money and it's the same kind of thing and mm. it's amazon as well so how or amazon uh android mm-hmm. so how do you compete against that anyways i guess you got to keep drawing the price down and and get people to to want to get it but we'll have oh, to see what happens i'm exactly. interested to know anyway because it's a big mm-hmm. transition when it comes to gaming that I can get a gaming system like this for, like, yeah. I don't know what it is, 90 bucks or something like that? I know. And it comes with a remote? That makes it t- tough, actually, as competitors to... I think to, so, oh. yeah. I wouldn't want to be in that market. Yeah. All right. A big thanks this week to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us. If you found a news story you'd like to send, email it to newsroom at category5.tv. For all your tech news with a slight Linux bias, visit the Category5.tv newsroom at newsroom.category5.tv. For the Category5.tv newsroom, I'm Sasha Dermatis. Thanks, Sasha. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Welcome to the show. It's episode number 404, but we're here anyways. (laughs) What? I know you were expecting an error. An error? Oh, no. 404. But, um. Ah, ah, oh, ah. I get it. French class. <sighs> French class? Never mind. Oh, I'm lost. I need. It's okay. Don't I, I Google need, it, everyone. Just Google figure it. figure this all out. Okay. You need to translate me. Um, I would just like to say at this moment in time, thank you to our fabulous community of viewers. We have some new friends who have joined us. They've subscribed to us on Roku. So Interweb Tech and True RL, thank you for doing that. Thank you also to George Mariano Paz Flores for sharing the show this week with your Spanish speaking friends friends using Google Plus. So cool. So thank you for doing that. Thank you to our friends who have donated um, and used our partner links this week. We have a lot of uh, changes going on in the studio, um, some pressing needs, and your donations really, really, really help to um, supplement that. Some things we are kind of working towards right now, a hard drive array in our storage server is full, so we're looking to replace a 500 gig with four terabytes. That would be like great, right? I'm deleting things in order to make room for the weekly show. It's getting kind of nuts. Yeah, it would be nice to throw another hard drive in there. It's an unraid server, right? So mm-hmm. I can just add a bigger hard drive, pull yeah. out another 500 meg, uh, 500 gig drives, and throw a, a four terabyte in. That would be brilliant. That's yeah. what we're working towards. That some other things. 4K camera, better camera equals better show. People, hello. Um, <laughs> we also need a printer. I'm looking off the screen here for my uh, prompting it's, notes. It's, hmm. We're doing our best, and I'm and I don't know if you noticed, but during the interview and everything, I'm using a, a first gen iPad that I was able to send a PDF to in order to, and it it worked, and I got my notes, and I'm doing my best. But yeah, a printer would be really really helpful because. Uh, typically, we, we do need to print um, a little bit each mm-hmm. week. We're mindful that we don't want to be wasting uh, no, resources of course or not. causing garbage or whatever, but uh, we do need to be able to print. So we appreciate your contributions. We do. And if you helped us tonight, we thank you so much. Or any time in the past, we, I mean, we really thank you. And we also have a little something something called the tip jar if you're uh, feeling the love. I mean, we won't decline <laughs> your very generous donations. And uh, you can find out more about that at donate.category5.tv. But we really do appreciate all your support because we do this because we love you all and we want to be able to help you as best we can and provide the information for free. Yeah, that's it. Uh, and speaking of free, it's kind of an interesting way to support us. Um, just so you know, we got a check this week from Amazon. And that is thanks to you going to uh, Amazon through our links. If you go to category5.tv, click on support us, and then you'll see our affiliate links. So as you shop 
on Amazon anyways, or eBay or B&H Photo Video and all these different ones that are there. So make sure you go check it out. Uh, if you click our links, then we get a kickback. That's cool. And it added up enough that we got another check. So and that helps us with, uh, with rent and everything mm-hmm. else. Uh, we need to turn down the air conditioner in here. That would be nice too. And all these things do cost money, and, and yeah. that's just how it goes. Hey, uh, one thing that is really important to our show is that we realize and recognize the importance of open source, free open source software, the ability to use uh, alternative software, whether you're on Linux, Windows, Mac, it doesn't matter. I mean, if I want to use LibreOffice, hey, I can do that on Windows <laughs> as well as I can do it on Linux. And we just want to give a shout out to somebody who is making that switch, giving it a go, Sarah, who is the director of the, uh, of the EPA uh, with Voodoo Sandman. Oh. Um, she is making the move making to the open switch. source. And Way if to you go. are making that transition, <laughs> hey, we're here to help. Totally. Um, so bookmark us, category5.tv, write it down. Go to our shop, get one of these stickers, or send us a postcard, and we'll send you stickers absolutely free True. if you're one of the next four people. <laughs> and then you can stick this on your monitor, and, and then you'll remember to check out the show every single week. I know we've got viewer questions. I want to do, do what we can. Let's tackle these. Thanks for joining us tonight, everybody. Okay. From North Carolina. What did we say? Spagandow? Spaghetti? Yeah. Spaghetti, spaghetti, spaghetti. We don't know. We appreciate your question, though. I just can't read your name. Forgive me. I need a translator. Okay. <laughs> you gave it to me last week. First time user it. login. Been watching Cat5 via Roku for nine months. Just installed Ubuntu 14.04 LTS. I use ATI Ra- Radeon um, 4670 dual display graphics card. I installed the open source graphics driver, not the proprietary drivers. I tried to install TD Ameritrade's Think or Swim Trading PGM. <laughs> Your emails are coming up on her screen, so she's trying to read this read. email, and there's more stuff popping up. So, Using okay. um, Linux Star. <laughs> you know what? I'll just, I'm going to take a lot stab of technical. I can see over here. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, hey, you've been watching on Roku for nine months. That's awesome. Roku's a great platform. We absolutely love it, and we love that you found us there. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, you got Ubuntu 14.04 Long-Term Support Edition uh, using a, a Radeon 4670 dual display. That's a, the graphics card in their computer oh, okay. uh, mm-hmm. that allows them to you know, view stuff. Graphics cards are important <laughs> for that. Uh, using the open source graphics drivers, not the proprietary ones, so not the ones that are provided by ATI, uh, tried to install TD Ameritrade's Think or Swim. I think this is where we're going with it. Trading PGM, which is program, using uh, a, an SH file. Hmm. So here's my instant summary. I'm not as quick as yapping, <laughs> but here it is. I'm going to translate. So we've got Boom. TD Ameritrade's Think or Swim app trying to get it working on Linux threw it into the bin folder using sudo to try to access it through uh, Nautilus and the terminal and installed it from inside the terminal it installed okay however when they open thinkorswim nothing shows up oh dear the program seems to be running they can see the title bar but nothing there hmm. so uh, i'm not actually familiar with thinkorswim uh, i do know that it's a java application so you have to have a current version of uh, the the Java platform so uh, you can go into your repositories I think what it's going to boil down to here is making sure that you've got up-to-date current stuff because that is mm. probably going to require uh, a, a newer version of, of Java uh, I think it's the the JVM Java virtual machine um, so if you're running, for example, I'm using an older version of Point Linux that's using Debian 7 as its core, and so I probably wouldn't be able to run Thinkorswim because it's using an older version of Java. Hmm. Gotcha. So I would actually have to get something a little more bleeding edge. So what uh, you're using Ubuntu 14.04. I'm not sure of the, uh, the version of Java that you have in there. But I would start comparing things like uh, Antetergos is one that I looked at that I really like if I'm looking for something that's more bleeding edge. And if you are looking for something like Thinkorswim to operate, of course, you can contact them and and perhaps they'll lend a Mm -hmm. little bit of support. Uh, But as far as it goes, you do need to have a little more bleeding edge um, software. Now, you've installed Ubuntu 14.04, which is it was released 
last April. Um, so it's over a year old. It's a long-term support addition. So that means that they are going to basically, um, how would you say, stop updating software that could potentially break things because mm -hmm. it's, it's meant to be a stable platform. So sometimes with an LTS release, the uh, adoption of, uh, or the adoption, I should say, uh, to use a word that actually exists, <laughs> of newer versions of software takes longer on an LTS. That's mm. why there is 15.04 that's not LTS because you'll find that the software packages that come in 15.04 are going to be much newer than the ones on 14.04 because it's long-term support, right? Mm. So you, you like the idea of having one that is you're not going to have to upgrade for four years or whatever it is. But the drawback is you don't get current packages. So you need something that's a little more current. Work around. Install VirtualBox. Get the most bleeding edge version of any distro. I would suggest probably staying away from Debian unless you want to go unstable. Uh, because anything in the stable branch is going to be the um, same situation as, uh, as an LTS. Hmm. Basically similar kind of thing. I, I, as I said, there's one called Antergos that is based on Arc. It's got a nice installer, but still gives you ARC and uh, the ability to um, tap into the, uh, the repositories there, which are a little more bleeding edge and, and, and current. So do that in a virtual machine, all right? Cool. Thanks for A little for suggestion the for you. So VirtualBox is the way to start, and then get something bleeding edge running within VirtualBox and try that. Good luck. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Please keep us posted. We appreciate that. I have a, a little something something, not a question, but a little, right. where you been, Agamotto? Agamotto! Huh? We've missed ya. Well, work has been keeping me away quite a bit, but here's another reason why I have not been in the chat room most Tuesday nights. What is no that excuses. reason? What's the excuse? My new dog, Isabella. She's half Shih Tzu, half Poodle. And here is <laughs> I'm going to see if I can get a look at this. Aww. Sent us a wee little photo to, to give us a taste of, of the true um, reason. <gasps> oh, here we go. So here good. we go. It's coming. There you go. Aww. Well, hello, Isabella. So nice to see you. Everybody loves Aww. puppies. You know, if you want to uh, apologize for being away, best way to do it is woo us with cuteness. Send us your puppy pic. Like, we, we forgive hey, you. Hey, sorry I've been away. Here's a cute puppy. <laughs> we forgive you, okay? She's we adorable. Have to. We have to now. So cute. We <laughs> understand, okay? Do we have time for one more question? Well... I know we don't, but can we do it anyways? Well, I was wondering about... Maybe we should... Okay, what question do you want yeah, to do? I know, you want to give stuff away, right? Well, you know I love free stuff. Especially when it's Unraid 6 <gasps> Pro. I know, so I'm just thinking, we got to give the people what they want. Maybe we shouldn't do that. Maybe we should just do more questions. No. Maybe we should do a two-hour show, you have Sasha. To, we got yeah, please. Please. we should do a two-hour show. Could, could we do a two-hour? Come on. No, how about See, we just I give tried, away? I tried. How about we just give away an, a big prize? This is prize. a big prize, is this it is not? This is a big <laughs> prize. <laughs> you weren't watching last week. <laughs> Check out episode number 403 oh, of Category 5 Technology TV. You're going to learn all about Unraid. And we took a whole bunch of your ballots. I mean, a lot of them. Ooh. So we got to get this thing going. This is going to pump us to two hours because it's going to take a while to get through oh, the list. Oh, boy. Hey, uh, here we go. This is a draw for... A free copy of Unraid 6 Pro. Mm -hmm. I think that's 25 disc support. Could you imagine 192 terabytes of possible storage space? That's huge. That's you, a lot of stuff. You got to have the gear, but we'll give you the software to run it all. This is the Unraid 6 software that we were looking at last week. Uh, this is the Pro Edition, and there are n there's nothing holding you back from doing all the stuff that we talked about with John. Um, so, 
How many people um, filled out or sent in? There were well over 100 ballots that were cast. Oh, wow. And that's just over the past, since since last Tuesday. Uh, so, let's go through them. I saw Eminem. I saw Jean Christophe. Take care, let's Anthony. Fly by Albuquerque, Turkey. Oh, my goodness. John Patmore. Hey, for deep. Did Steve Steve? Ball yeah, we're in. Yeah, I saw Sparkly Ball. Spark Lee Balls. Whiskey Zero, there you are. See, there you Dennis go. Kelly. Get your there we go. Leon and Kessler. Bo Woody. There was Sparkly Balls. <laughs> Orange Man. <laughs> Old Salt. Nice to see you. Come on. Good luck, everybody. Yes, here we go. Love it. This is the real deal. It's the pro edition of Unraid 6. As discussed on episode number 403, make sure you check out that episode. And hey, if you were wondering about how Unraid kind of works from a technical standpoint, even though it's going back a ways, check out episode 103. And that's where we actually demoed a build of a, an old version of Unraid. And Unraid 6 simply gives you all these new great features, such as virtualization and Docker. Trevor! And the winner tonight of Unraid 6 Pro is Jay Thiessen. Congratulations, Jay. You are the winner of Unraid 6 Pro Edition. We'll pop you an email. Thanks for tuning in tonight, and thank you so much uh, for casting your ballots and for checking out Category 5 TV. I know a lot of people that, uh, that found out about us through the uh, Unraid feature. And uh, we love having you here. Hope you'll tune in again. Congratulations again to Jay Thiessen. And that is all the time that we have. I know I wanted to keep going. Sorry, guys. It's just too much fun, isn't it? A lot of partying and the hour this just episode. goes right by. But keep those questions coming in, all right? <laughs> Please do. Live at Category5.tv. Do you, do you have our, you've got our new address there? I do. If you want to send us a little something, something via snail bill, you can do that. Category 5 TV. 336 Young Street, Suite 166. That is in Barrie, Ontario, which it is in Canada. Postal code L4N4CA. We look forward to getting your stuff via mail and we'll send you a little sticker if you're the next four to do so. For free? Why, for free. yes. That's it. I'll send you that. <laughs> Sounds good. Hill, thanks for being here tonight. Hey, it's nice to see you. Thanks for having As me. As you say, it's been a while, but uh, hopefully it won't be too few and far between. Hope to be back summer. soon. Yeah. Thanks, Sasha, everyone. Sasha, thanks, buddy. Thank you. Have a wonderful week, everyone, and we'll see you next Tuesday night. Bye. Good night. We hope you enjoyed the show. Category 5 TV broadcasts live from Barrie, Ontario, Canada every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern. If you're watching this on demand or through cable TV, check out the local showtimes in your area at Category5.tv and find out when you can watch live and interact in the community chat room. Category 5 is a production of Prodigy Digital Solutions and is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 2.5 Canada. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in.